Future Church saved my faith. My main reason for being involved in Future Church is the hope that it provides to me and to my family. I became involved in Future Church um, because it's Catholic and because it has a vision for the kind of church that I believe Jesus wants us to have. The idea of Future Church saying we're looking for a church that has hope, that has promise, that has optimism about what its future can be. So I can't say enough about Future Church. I wouldn't be a Catholic if I weren't a member, I believe. I continue to be a part of Future Church and work with Future Church because I'm very passionate about my faith, I'm passionate about being Catholic, and I'm passionate about my faith community. Future Church plays an important role in analyzing, understanding where the church is, where the church needs to be, and how we're going to get there. And it's a, an organization that is going to do great things for the church. And so before you knew it, we're gathering all these disparate leadership from very many parishes around Cleveland into St. Malachi Basement on October 16th, 1990. I can still remember in the school hall with the newsprint up and, and we had some 30 some folks from 16 different parishes get together that night. So coming to Future Church um, is, uh, is a real gift for me personally because I think uh, the Catholic Church, I love it, uh, the church, but it is really one of the last bastions of patriarchy in an institution to stand as strong as it stands to really have ex to keep the exclusion of women up at the level it still does is a sign uh, that we have a lot of work to do yet and I'm ready to go on that, you know. So when they were having this International Synod on the Eucharist and the preparatory document didn't say anything about the worldwide priest shortage, we knew we had to be there. Going from not even being mentioned, the priest shortage ended up being one of three major issues that dominated the Synod. Priests are recognizing that their days are numbered. You know, yeah. they are, you know, their numbers are shrinking. We're, we're going to hit a brick wall when it comes to the priest shortage. You know, four years in the United States. Half the diocesan priest will be at retirement age. That's a brick wall. Yeah. So the international priest associations from uh, Austria, Australia, Germany, Switzerland, the United States, uh, Ireland, you know, are come together on a regular basis now. And mm -hmm. uh, we're now planning for the next face-to-face -face meeting. We just met uh -huh. in Limerick in April, mm -hmm. and the next one will be in the United States. So uh, the, eight, the Association of U.S. Catholic Priests and Future Church will be partnering to bring the, them to the United States. This was a success on very many levels. One, the most women ever were invited as both auditors and um, paridi or experts for the small groups. There were six women chosen to be experts in the small groups. We were able to meet with three of them while we were in Rome. So that was a, a victory. And then secondly, um, the final proposition had, one of them was praising women in the ministry of the word which had never happened. We need women's voices. Mm -hmm. We need women preaching. Right. When, when we hear someone bring that experience to, to the readings, it's, it, it makes such a difference mm -hmm. for women in the church and men in the church to hear how women can theologically reflect on, on uh, whatever reading mm -hmm. it is for the week. In seminary, I was 
totally destroyed to learn that there is no biblical evidence whatsoever that Mary Magdala was a prostitute. And in fact, she was the leader in proclaiming the good news of the resurrection. And so um, when through our Women in Church Leadership effort, we were able to raise up who she was. And the first year we had 23 celebrations. The reason that women keep doing this every summer is because it meets some deep need in our female psyches to know that we are equally called and missioned for um, serving God in sacred roles. We still know there's much room to grow, and so I'm going to ask each one of you just to say a little bit about your own dreams and hopes for church, women in church leadership, women in decision-making roles in the Catholic Church. You know, what do you want to see enhanced? What do you want to see changed? the unacceptable loss of yet another vibrant ethnic treasure. Cleveland Catholic churches were closed or merged back in 2009. Several appealed and the Vatican reversed the decision. Tonight, News Channel 5 has an inside look at one little known organization that played a big part in saving those parishes. I feel very proud that that program was already launched. We had already helped people in other dioceses. But in Cleveland, over the course of the next three years, we provided resources, people did their own organizing in their parishes, and we reversed um, Bishop Lennon's decisions in 13 parishes. When you see what's going on with Catholics in New York, what they do, what they're mm -hmm. doing, the, the sort of, uh, you know, taking up whatever tools they can and, you know, saying keep our parish open and, and using the yeah. channels that are available to them, you, I, I mean, this. we have not fully told the story of either their heroism or the pain of having parishes closed yeah. down regularly. Because of our early foundation and our belief in dialogue with church leadership, Future Church never wavered from calling our Episcopal leadership to, I would say, accountability, but also engaging them about matters concerning the good of the church. Father Lou Trevisan was the one who taught us all about Canon 212, that we have the right and the obligation to make our views known on matters concerning the good of the church. The church needs to listen to those they have excluded yeah. for so long and to, and to hear the wisdom and the love and the faith that they bring to our tradition. Is yes, I'm Deborah Rose Milibet from Future Church in the United States, and my question is for Archbishop Martin. Um, in an interview this week, Josh McAuley from National Catholic Reporter interviewed uh, U.S. Sacred Heart of Mary's sister, Maureen Kelleher, who was in English Group D, she said there was a clear cultural divide between bishops and laypersons' point of view, and at times she faced condescension so heavy you could cut it with a knife. Do you think the women in your group, there were four, experienced the same dynamic? And can you give us some concrete and specific ways that contributions of the women in your group were integrated into your small group reports? It's difficult sometimes for us to, to to sit back and wait for a church that oftentimes thinks in generations or even centuries. But I can see it from both places, and I can see that Pope Francis is accomplishing miracles. And yet I can say, oh, please hurry up. We have to do more. Sure, and, sure. All right, well, if anybody can make it happen, future church can, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of people will make it happen, but we'll do our part. Yeah, that's for sure. that sounds great. <laughs>